We now in the Old Testament. We're looking again in the book of Ecclesiastes. This is quite a long passage we have today. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 8, all the way down to chapter 7, verse 29. Now there is a separate insert in your bulletins uh, where we've also printed this passage. Sorry. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse. Why is this the. It's supposed to be 10. Sorry. Uh, it's supposed to be Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 10, down to chapter 7, verse 29. Listen now to God's word. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life? which he passes like a shadow. For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter for by sadness of face the heart is made glad the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth it is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise and to hear the song of fools for as the crackling of thorns under a pot so is the laughter of the fools this also is vanity Surely, oppression drives the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful, and in the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Be not overly righteous. And do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. <clears throat> Wisdom gives strength to the wise more than ten rulers who are in a city. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sinned. Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. 
All this I have tested by wisdom. I said, I will be wise. But it was far from me. That which has been, that which has been is far off. And deep, very deep. Who can find it out? I turned my heart to know and to search out and seek wisdom and a scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. And I find something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Behold, this is what I found, says the preacher, while adding one thing to another to find a scheme of things, which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have not found. One man among a thousand I, uh, I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. See, this alone I found, that God made, made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to read to you a couple of well principles or, or laws and see if you recognize them. Law number three, conceal your intentions. Law number four, always say less than necessary. Law number five, so much depends on reputation. Guard it with your life. Law number nine, win through your actions, never through argument. Law number 12, use selective honesty and generosity to disarm your victim. Law 24, play the perfect courtier. Law 32, play the people's fantasies. Law 33, discover each man's thumbscrew. Law 34, be royal in your fashion. Act like a king to be treated like one. Law 38, Things, think as you like, but behave like others. Law 43, work on the hearts and minds of others. Law 45, preach the need for change, but never reform too much at once. Law 46, never appear too perfect. Now that's just a sampling of actually 48 laws. Uh, it's in a book by Robert Greene <clears throat> called The 48 Laws of Power. How many of you are familiar with that book? Yes, my sister knows it because I have a copy. It's actually one of the books that uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading many years ago because uh, it spoke, as it were, to um, common sense. If you are to live in this world, which some have characterized as a dog-eat-dog -dog world, well, you got to have some advantage. And the 48 Lost Power, uh, following after uh, Gershan Balthasar, uh, 16th or 17th century Jesuit priest who wrote a book, uh, uh, the book of worldly wisdom. Okay? Uh, it, it's quoted extensively in, in Robert Greene's book. Um, th these are just a few of the principles that are laid out in the book. And like I said, I, I quite enjoyed reading it. It's filled with anecdotes from history, tidbits of worldly wisdom, as it were, on how to get a hand in life. Uh, today, uh, and earlier even as I was reading our passage today, um, I, I want you to see actually some s similarities. It's like here, the preacher, well, is rambling. And he's just throwing wisdom after wisdom, uh, proverb after proverb. Um, and so today as we continue in Ecclesiastes, we want to also consider a series of general principles, if you will, proverbs really, that Kohelet puts forward for living life under the sun. And if you've been coming for, uh, since we began with our series on Ecclesiastes, you know that under the sun, this phrase is something of a shorthand that the author, that the, chief, that the preacher uh, uses to describe questing in life 
uh, without a conscious and conscientious God principle. Okay, so he would have references to God, but then within that framing, this is living life uh, without um, a, a faithful uh, following or, or belief in God. Okay, so, so more deistic, if you will, questing in life uh, without a God principle. And you will remember Kohala's purpose in this book. It is to give a walkthrough, if you will, of what life is like under the sun. And uh, essentially what he's saying, if, if it could be summarized like a Yelp review, been there, done that, you can't afford it anyway, don't do it. Zero stars. And that's a refrain that he always gives over and over in this book. Vanity of vanities. Vapor actually is a better translation of vanity. It's, it's all vapor. It's here in a moment, it's gone. It's, it's pointless, it's absurd, it's useless, it's meaningless. And that's what he keeps saying over and over again, under the sun. You seek riches, it's vanity, it's vapor, it's gonna be gone. You seek recognition, you seek um, uh, whatever you high delights upon, even that is vanity, he says. And now we've come to the midway point of the book, okay, chapter 6 and 7. This morning's text is still framed by this under the sun hypothesis. And today we look at the long passage that expresses an attitude that I would like to describe as resigned realism. See, that's, that's what Kohelet seems to be putting forward. Because he's been, he's been pushing this idea of the under the sun hypothesis. Under the sun, there's no God. Under the sun, really, there's no meaning. There's no significance. And so, if you want to continue in that, these are a set of principles or proverbs to follow uh, if you adopt that kind of a resigned realism. Okay? And so, although it's a long passage, we'll try to breeze through it together and just glean the three things that I believe Kohelet is trying to teach us uh, with his resigned realism uh, in this section. In your bulletin under page three, um, it should be printed there, our three headings. Number one, nobody's really wise. Number two, nobody's ever perfect. And number three, nobody's safe at all. Okay, very simple. And so I didn't provide uh, additional keywords for the kids. Nobody's wise, nobody's perfect, nobody's safe. Okay, so kids, when you go home, ask your parents, what did pastor mean uh, that nobody is wise? Papa, I thought you were wise. Uh, nobody's perfect. Mama, I thought that you were perfect. Okay? Nobody's safe, you mean I'm not safe? Okay, so, so ask your parents when you go home, and, and uh, parents, are wondering, I want you to um, pay attention to the, these three headings. I know it's a long passage, but at least be able to communicate the gist of it to your parents when you go, to your kids when you go home. Okay, so number one, nobody's really wise. Uh, if you look at your English Bibles, uh, beginning with chapter 7, um, there is a new section there. Okay, In, in most English Bibles, uh, the format should be different. You're moving now from a more of a prose format to a poetic format. Okay, And, and you will find here, in chapter 7, verses 1 to 12, uh, better than the sayings. We, we've encountered this in chapter 3. We first encountered this in chapter 3. Better than. This is better than this. Better than uh, better this than that. Okay? It's a list of proverbs or wise sayings quoted by the preacher with some additional rogue comments, if you will, to illustrate that conventional wisdom is not all it's cut out to be. It's actually a mixed bag is, is what the message is supposed to, uh, that you're supposed to get from it. It's a mixed bag of good and bad. Uh, but mostly bad, the point being made is this. Under the sun, wisdom is relative. It's unreliable. It depends upon your circumstances. It depends upon um, your stature in life. It depends upon who you are. And it's hard to grasp. Okay? But I also want you to note well uh, that there is a theological framing to this. Okay? Um, if you look at chapter 6, 
verses 10 to 12, that is the first framing, the opening, uh, what do you call that? Well, the open bookend, the first bookend, and the uh, other bookend is chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. So let me read that to you, verse 10 uh, to 12. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity, and what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives a few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? And then the other book end, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider God has made one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. And so that's the framing of the better than sayings. First, you have to understand the relationship Kohelet, uh, in his resigned realism, brings forth between man and God. Man is weaker, God is greater. Who he cannot dispute with someone stronger than him. Okay? Uh, he cannot make out what, what God has done. And so, this is, as we look at this, we need to understand this list is not a wholesale recommendation by the preacher. In fact, he is deconstructing the received wisdom of his day with his own realism. But let, let's first consider the theological context, okay, which I just read. Man is unable to dispute with one stronger than he. Kohelet is putting man in his place. Man's wisdom, which what is being framed here is supposed to be, man's wisdom is nothing compared to God's wisdom. And at the onset, you need to understand that. It would be the height of adversity, absurdity, even to attempt to dispute with him. My wisdom against God's wisdom. He cannot make straight what is crooked by God's design. Now, that's supposed to make you scratch your head a bit. God makes things crooked? Again, remember, under the sun hypothesis, go ahead and working with irony here. Okay. Even if God were to make something crooked, man's wisdom cannot match with his, and you cannot make that straight. So that's the theological framing that we have here. More words simply mean more vanity. It's no use. Whatever knowledge or information he comes up with does not get him closer to understanding how things are. And we know that for a fact, don't we? A hundred years ago, there was no internet, there was no cell phones, smartphones, okay? the kind of theological advancement, advancement in, in, in uh, transportation, communication, and medicine that you have today. But man today, our wisdom today does not surpass the wisdom of man a hundred years ago when it comes to the meaning and significance of all of it. The same, you know, there's this, there's this false idea that if we just evolve enough and progress enough as a humanity, uh, as we up the level of our human flourishing through medical, uh, technological advancement, then we'll be able to solve all of our problems. It's been centuries. We've never solved the problem of greed, of pride. We've never solved the problem of sin, as it were. And Gwendolyn is reflecting that to us here. More words simply means more vanity. It's no use. Whatever knowledge, information comes up with, with man comes up with does not get him closer to understanding how things are. Information does not equate to truth and meaning. 
His life is vain, and he passes it just like a passing shadow. He's ephemeral, fleeting, like the shadow of bird that flies over us. There's no knowing, humanly speaking, of anything beyond the sun. Nobody has ever come back from the dead to tell you what to expect. We can only grasp that which is material, that which is physical, not the metaph metaphysical. And hence, Kohelet's resigned realism. So very quickly, we're going to breeze through these verses. Verses 1 to 4. A good name is better than precious ointment. And that, right? And the day of death and the day of birth. Oh, hold on, hold on. What do you mean? It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. And this is the end of all man for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. <clears throat> Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of faith the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the house but the heart of fools in the house is in the house of mirth. What's quite that saying? He's saying it's better to be dead than alive. If you're just living it out, you know, you're just living it up, you're enjoying your life. Oh, what a fool you are. Because under the sun, none of that really matters. You're, you're going to die just like the next person. And what he's saying essentially is the day of death is better than the day of birth because when you're dead, you cease to suffer. I know it's grim. But that's the resigned realism you get, you know, under the sun. And then, and then you read further, verse 5 to 7. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. What's he saying? The crackling of thorns under a pot. Uh, most of you modern people probably don't cope <clears throat> using, you know, wood stoked uh, anymore, unless you know you have a brick fire oven. But most of you don't know this reference to the crackling of, of thorns um, when you're in uh, a uh, less progressive area, uh, or maybe when you're camping. Um, or when you're doing your campfire, you hear that, right? There's sound that comes out of the crackling of, uh, of, uh, of the firewood. Okay? Uh, and, and essentially he's saying, that's just like the laughter of fools. It makes a sound, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have sense. Okay? So here, verses 5 to 7, Kohelet seems to say, there's no such thing as a person who is always wise. An incorruptible wise man. Look at verse 7. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness and a bribe corrupts the heart. Tami ganun ngayon yan sa Facebook at sa Costos. The wise man, well, he's also corruptible. Under the, under the sun. In fact, the translation, better translation for verse 7 is beginning with verse 6 for as a crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. This also is vanity because oppression drives the wise into madness and the bribe corrupts the heart. Nobody's really wise. Verse 8 and 9 better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. What's he saying? Kohelet seems to be saying, under this resigned realism, it just leaves us all as fools. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. The patient spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. And how many of us have never become angry? I'm sure right now you're angry about something. 
or someone, you know? And, and anger, whenever you're angry, that's when you act foolishly. In the heat of the moment, you say foolish things. In the heat of the moment, you do things, destructive things, that you cannot repair or take back again. And we are, we are all victim to that. And under the sun, under this resigned realism, nobody is really wise, as it says. Verse 12, 10 to 12. Say not, why were the former days better than this? These, for it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money, and the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Again, here's Kohede saying, don't ask that question. Why are the former days better than, than these? <clears throat> have you not considered that those who have gone before you are just that? They've gone. They're dead. Were they wise? Were they fools? The wise man dies. The fool dies. They're not better off. You're not better off. The protection of money and wealth is just like protection of wisdom. It's only as good as when you're alive. But the reality, all this is driving at is, look, you try to live your life as a wise man, as a good man, a righteous person, but under the sun, you have to resign to the realism that none of that ultimately will matter. You might enjoy a good life because you, you've earned money, you've inherited money. You might enjoy a, a better life than the person who is not educated because you went to the best schools or because you applied yourself to study more than other people. But in the end, you're going to die. And what good is that? <laughs> Go ahead and actually when he uses the better than, better than sayings, he's saying this is better than this, it's not the best. It's better than this, it's not the best. Because under the sun, there is no best. And so the first thing we see here is nobody is really wise in the final analysis. Your wisdom accounts for nothing under the sun. Next, nobody's ever perfect. In this section, in verses, uh, chapter 7, verses 15 to 24, Kohelet seems to give some odd advice as to being what it means to be righteous or wise, what it means to be foolish or wicked. So he, he um, pits the two in opposition. And what we need to understand is that in Hebrew wisdom literature, or in ancient Near Eastern uh, wisdom literature, as it were, righteousness and wisdom are virtually synonymous. And so are foolishness and wickedness. And so when the Bible talks about the fool, uh, this is almost always equated with the wicked. And when the Bible talks about the upright man or the righteous man, this uh, is almost always equated with a wise. Now think about Psalm 1. Uh, that's a wisdom psalm. Blessed is the man, happy, good, righteous, okay? Who delights in the law of the Lord. On his law he meditates day and night. It's contrasted with the wicked, okay? And so here we see a Kohelet uh, giving another string of odd advices. Um, about wisdom, and righteousness on one hand, and foolishness and wickedness on the other hand. So in a way, Kohelet here is arguing. What he's arguing here is really no different what, than what he's already told us in the last section. Since no one is really wise to know what is good, and because more words only result in more vanity, so essentially, nobody is ever perfect. And so this section reinforces what he's already said. 
but in a different way. And so this being the case, what is his recommendation? He says, under the sun, because you're never going to be consistently the wise man. You're going to have your moments of foolishness as well, which means you're never really going to be perfect. You're also going to be wicked sometimes. Be a moderate. Don't be too righteous. Don't be too foolish. Embrace both sides since you're a mix of both. Nobody's perfect. To err is human. What kind of wisdom is this, you ask? How different is this purported wisdom from what we read in the 48 Laws of Power? Well, the answer is not all that different. Remember, this is Kohelet offering up an approach to life under the sun as a kind of resigned realism. Nobody's really wise, nobody's ever perfect, so just go with it. I remember when I was in university, uh, we were studying Chinese philosophy. Uh, and in Taoist philosophy, there's a principle called Wei Wu Wei, uh, which essentially translates to active non-action. Or if you want to think more in terms of a Zen Buddhism, um, you know, active meditation or Zazen, uh, being there, right there in, in the presence of things, um, and just going with the flow. It's interesting that all of these, well, insufficient philosophies or religions prescribe the same thing, don't they? They have this resigned realism. Just go with the flow, with the balance, the harmony of things. And that's what you see. Kohelet is saying, under the sun, that's all you that's the best that you can get. Don't resist. Go with the flow. And so the latter portion of this section, in the latter portion of this section, Kohelet chronicles his quest, his personal quest for the elusive wisdom. The all-elusive, elusive wisdom. Have a look with me quickly in verses, chapter 7, verse 23 to 25. He says, All this I have tested with by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been is far off, and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? I turn my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and the scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness of that that is madness. Do you know how to spot a wise person? A wise person does not go around saying, I'm wise. <laughs> right? The wise person is the one that you look up to because they have had experience. They've learned through experience, through trial and error, the best, you know, best practice, as it were, to living. And Kohelet says, I've tried that. I've said to myself, I will be wise. But then it was far from me. Oh yes, it was far from me because if that's where you start, Wisdom will really be far from you. And he says, I've tried that. Wisdom, it's, it's there, but it is elusive. It's hard to catch. It's hard to possess. Sometimes it just passes you by. Sometimes you, you grab a, get, get a wisp of it, get some of it. But the, the, where, where, where can you find wisdom? I believe all of you want to be wise. All of you want to be wise, sir, at the very least. And the question really is, under the sun, where do I go to look for wisdom? And it would seem, Kohelet is saying, nowhere. Nowhere. Now, of course, the New Testament tells us, if anyone lacks wisdom, ask from God. And He will abundantly give. But here you don't find any of that. 
wisdom's there, but it's elusive, it's hard to catch, can't possess it. Sometimes wisdom is folly, and folly is wisdom. And in the final analysis, under the sun, it's not all that clear cut, is it? As we'd like it to be. Sometimes one person's wisdom, when you look at it, it's, that's really foolish. Ever seen those, you know, purported life hacks on TV, <laughs> know, on, on social media? Some people swear by it, you gotta do this. And, and that's, you know, they're peddling wisdom, right? But for some people, that's just foolish. And, and there, there are foolish people who try legitimate life hacks and do videos on it and really fail bad and say it's foolish, but they're actually the fools because they didn't do it the right way. And so it's illusive. That's, that's what Kohel is saying. And so you get to the last one, last point. Nobody's safe at all. Nobody's safe. Chapter 7, verse 25 29. Kohelet says, he sought to understand the scheme of things. He tried to make out what wisdom was by understanding what wickedness and folly truly were made of. He's tried repeatedly to grasp it, but it always seems to elude him. But in this passage, he tells us three things that he's found. And I want to begin uh, by first apologizing to the women. There are things he says here that sound misogynistic, and they are. Okay? Not making apologies for that. But again, remember, this is go ahead questing under the sun. Okay? So this is not what God recommends men. So these are three things that he's found. He says, number one, the woman, the woman who entraps sinners in verse 26. And I find sometimes something more bitter than death. A woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but a sinner is taken by her. Okay. This is a logical conclusion, of course, based on what he's already been saying. In verse 20, he says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. And so everyone is, one way or another, the victim to another person. And sometimes perpetrator and victimizing other people as well. Number two, he says, the bleakness of this picture is magnified by the second thing he says he's found. The lone righteous man in a thousand and the complete absence of any righteous women. This is obviously non-literal, but when we realize what he's saying, he's actually being kind already. Because if you scour the human population, you will not find even one righteous man, let alone woman, is what he said. But ignore what he says for the moment, no? and consider how this has been interpreted throughout history. If anything, what he says about one righteous man in a thousand actually it illustrates what he's been trying to drive at all this while. There is no one righteous. No, not one. And because of that, there is no person who is wise. Wisdom is elusive. And in the final analysis, nobody is safe from folly. You might be sitting there and you might be saying, not me, I'm not foolish, I'm wise. <laughs> Maybe these people beside me, behind me, in front of me, they're foolish, not me. Can I say to you that's the most foolish thought you can have? <laughs> and nobody can escape that. Everyone is in, final, in the final analysis. A fool. <laughs> Nobody is safe from the clutches of folly, and thus all are wicked. And the last thing that he says he 
he's found out God made us straight but we devised many schemes and really this is the last verse of chapter 7 and really this is the whole point of it isn't it he says see this alone I I found that God made man upright but they have sought out many schemes it's been said, and, and, and this harkens all, of course, all the way back to the fall. It's been said that Adam and Eve's sin was not so much law breaking as it was law making. They were grasping at that which was not proper to them. They were wanting to be a law to themselves. God has made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. This goes all the way back to the fall and highlights the real problem here under the sun. And this is what gives birth to Kohelet's resigned realism under the sun. It's the only option left to the sinner. If you're going to continue questing in this life without reference to God, being the captain of your soul, being unbeholden to anyone but yourself this is what you've got for you this is what you can expect you're gonna try to be wise but you're gonna be frustrated because nobody's ever been wise you're gonna try to be moral and upright and not get into trouble but nobody's ever perfect and the reality is nobody's safe from this reality under the sun. In a final analysis, the resigned realism in this passage leaves us with the ultimate realization that we're all sinners. All this resigned realism only accentuates our sinfulness and our lostness. And from that, nobody is safe. This is the sad and sorry state that all humans find themselves under the sun. The resigned realism does not help because what this means is that we are never going to arrive at wisdom, we are never going to be perfect, and we are all never going to be saved from folly. And worse, God's wrath for all of that. Kohelet says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. And you know what? He's right about this too. And this all the more emphasizes the futility of verse 26 when it says that he who pleases God escapes foolishness. But who does? Who pleases God? Who is righteous anyway? No one. No one in Kohelet's time. None of his readers. Not among us, actually. None in, his, none in his time, and no one for another few hundred years. But there was one who later came who fits the bill. The one to whom God himself declared, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3.17 The one to whom Luke wrote as having increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. This man was Jesus. And he was the only righteous one whose wisdom was perfect. He came to earth and was born as a baby, weak and vulnerable, just like we all were. And though he was the epitome of straightness and uprightness, he voluntarily subjected himself to be bent and crooked in humiliation and suffering. Though he was pleasing to God and was safe from the clutches of foolishness, he subjected himself to an ordeal that the Bible describes as the foolishness of God. He made himself a fool 
and the ultimate demonstration of God's wisdom by dying on the cross. Jesus was a true wise man who was truly perfect but who threw safety and security out the window by being nailed to the cross. And he did it so that you and I, who are truly foolish, who are wicked, and who are, ne who are ever in the clutches of sin and foolishness, you and I might have his perfection and uprightness credited to us through faith. This is why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25, about the gospel. But he says, this is foolishness. It's the foolishness of God. He says, verse 25, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to break to nothing, things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of Him, you... Because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so, we come to the end of it. If you look at this passage, under the sun, there's no hope for us. Only resigned realism. Everyone's a fool. Everyone's wicked. No one is exempt. And in the final analysis, we're going to have to all pay for that. But God has turned things around. Turned things around by making provision. It is the foolishness of God. It's foolishness to the Greeks. A stumbling block to the Jews. Jesus subjected to the futility of this world so that in Him, you and I, fools that we are, if we repent, if we believe in Him, we become the righteousness of God. And that is the hope that we are to look to. When you look at this passage, there's no hope here. It's, it's meant by negative to drive you to Christ. Folly, folly, evil, wickedness. There's no hope here under the sun. But in Jesus there is. In Him alone should we hope. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks uh, for this passage. We give you thanks that as we continue in this very strange book, as it were, Kohelet, just laying it out for us. Straight talk, as it were. This is what you can expect if you live life under the sun. You're going to try to look for wisdom. It's going to elude you. You're going to try to be upright. But you're going to fail. And really, there is no hope there. But we give you thanks. Because in Jesus there is. We give you thanks that you have use the foolish things of this world to shame the wise you have devised through the gospel of your son to save fools like us to reconcile us to you we ask O oh lord that even as we continue meditating upon your words and as we respond lord that you cause these truths to be buried deep in our hearts to dwell richly in our hearts as well as in our minds not just now but even for the days and weeks to come. We pray all of these things in Jesus.